think I've so far covered material uh, worth three plus epsilon lectures, um, and this is the fifth lecture. So I think what we can, what we should probably try to do in today's lecture is finish material, uh, the material that I had uh, set down for my first four lectures initially. And what I had planned for my fifth lecture was um, an introduction to many body localization, which I don't think I'll be able to um, get to. But I am going to be around for uh, a good deal of next week. So please find me and ask me questions about this stuff and also about many body localization if you're interested. OK, so let me start with something which I should have um, discussed before talking about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And this is something which um, came up during, during the tutorial. So, the, so Benny's conjecture is that if you take a non-integrable system and you look at its energy eigenstates in some random basis, then those eigenstates, the coefficients of those eigenstates, so should essentially look like random numbers. Now, you can test this hypothesis by calculating these eigenstates, you know, as I said, because these are non-integrable systems which can't be solved exactly, you have to resort to numerics, and you can test how random these actually are. So a way of testing how random these eigenstates are in some given basis is by calculating what's called the Shannon entropy of the coefficients. Um, so this, if you remember, is an eigenstate of um, a non-integrable Hamiltonian. The i's are some generic basis that have been, you know, that has been given to you. And you can express the eigenstates in this generic basis with these coefficients. So now you have a column vector of these coefficients and you want to find out if they look random or not. Is there any way in which I can look at, you know, uh, lists of numbers and try to figure out whether they're random. Is there any way in which I can quantify the randomness? So it turns out that there's, you know, this, this kind of problem occurs in many different branches of science. And um, so a very efficient way of doing it is by calculating the Shannon entropy, which is this particular thing here, uh, at least in this case, where, you know, what we're really interested in is not so much these, but mods, you know, the, um, mod squared of these. At least we need that to define an entropy. We need these to be positive. Um, so this quantity is something which measures, if you like, the amount of randomness. So let's assume that what you had was not random, okay? So one example of something which is not random in a given basis, a list of numbers is, if one of the numbers is non-zero and everything else is zero, okay? That doesn't look random at all. Um, and if you had something like that, then you can see, you know, and here of course we assume that these are normalized. So sum over i mod psi m i squared is equal to one. So if you had one entry which was one and everything else which was zero, the entropy would be equal to zero. Okay. On the other hand, if this was this this was truly random, then what you might expect is there wouldn't be any bias in terms of how you would distribute these numbers for different i's. They would all roughly sort of look the same, and you might expect that they would have, you know, same magnitudes. And if that were the case, then you can see that SM would just be equal to the log of the number of entries which you have, which is the largest number that this can be, okay? So the Shannon entropy has sort of two bounds, and one bound when the entropy is equal to zero is when this list of numbers doesn't look random, and log D is the maximum amount of randomness that the list can have. So now what you could do, and so, all right, so it turns out now that you can actually calculate the Shannon entropy, assuming that these have been drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And when you do that for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, where you say that these are real numbers, these are not complex numbers, it turns out that uh, the Shannon entropy, and this is a calculation that can be done, that the Shannon entropy is like this. It actually goes as log d, but there's a, a number in front, which is 0.48. d here is the dimension of the Hilbert space. d is the number of i's that you've got. So what you can do is you can test this prediction for different quantum Hamiltonians and see if it actually does work by, <clears throat> as I said, obtaining these m's numerically and checking how close the s for a given m gets to this prediction. All right, so for that, 
<clears throat> we need a non-integrable system, okay? Um, and so the particular non-integrable system that's considered here in this numerical study is a Hamiltonian, um, you know, corresponds to a Hamiltonian which is given by this expression. Now the physical system that this describes is a one-dimensional lattice on which you have spinless fermions that are hopping, okay? Um, so is everyone here familiar with, I guess, fermions and perhaps even spinless fermions? A spinless fermion is basically a fermion which doesn't have spin, all right? And, and such things can exist in one dimension. All right, so then you have um, spinless fermions which can hop from side to side on this lattice. And here there are, so these are the fermionic creation and annihilation operators. Are people familiar with creation and annihilation operators? Okay, most of you are, good. So this is basically a term which um, says that a fermion hops from a side j to a side j plus one with amplitude capital J. So there's one hopping term like this, which is a nearest neighbor hop. And there's another hopping term, which is the next nearest neighbor hop. And I'll tell you in just a little bit why you need this. So that's um, one term. And this term here is an interaction between fermions. Okay, now these are fermions and they have no spin. So you can have at most one of these objects at a particular site, right? So if you look at a particular site, it either has a fermion or it doesn't. So because the maximum number of fermions you can have at a site is one, there's no notion of interactions of these fermions at a particular site. The simplest kind of interaction that you can have here is between fermions on adjacent sites. And that's what this thing is. The factor of one half here is to you know, explicitly make this thing particle hole symmetric, but that's not important for what I have to say. Okay, so you have this, which is an interaction between fermions on adjacent sites, and this is an interaction between fermions on next neighbor sites, okay? Fermions that are separated by one site, which have a, you know, site in between them. Now, the reason that this particular Hamilton, so, so if I didn't have these two terms, if I just had the first two terms, then this in some sense is the simplest model that you can write down for interacting spinless fermions in one dimension, right? They just hop to nearest neighbors and nearest neighbor and fermions on adjacent sites interact. That's the simplest thing that you can write down. But it turns out that this model without these two terms is actually integrable. It has an infinity of conservation laws in the thermodynamic limit of the sort that I mentioned in my previous lectures, okay? What those conservation laws are is something that I'm not going to go into right now. It turns out that for those of you who are familiar with general techniques of, um, you know, quantum mechanics and condensed matter, it's not very hard to derive the conservation laws for this model. But anyway, that's not important. What's important is that this is integrable. So if I had just this, <clears throat> The, I wouldn't expect the eigenstates to look random. And hence I add these terms, and these terms break the integrability, okay? These terms make the model non-integrable. And you might expect that, at least for a finite size system, the larger these terms are, in some sense, the more non-integrable the system becomes, okay? So that's what's being checked here. The eigenstates have been, so the coefficients of the eigenstates have been obtained in the real space basis, so these i's are here in this case basically labeling the occupancies of fermions on these lattice sites. So this is what you get. So this is exact diagonalization on um, system sizes 18, 21, and 24, which as far as one-dimensional systems um, like this are concerned is pretty much state of the art. I mean, you can't really go to system sizes which are much larger than this. So this is, so on the y-axis you have this quantity, um, the entropy divided by log of 1.48 times the dimension of the Hilbert space. On the x-axis you have the energy of the mth eigenstate, and what you do is you make, you make this plot, the scatter plot of this quantity for all the eigenstates for different system sizes, okay? So once again, remember that the less random this is, the smaller this is going to be. And the more random this is, the larger it's going to be. And in the limit of it actually being GOE, this should be equal to one. So you start with some reasonably small values of these perturbations. 
And then you can see that, you know, this was this, for the smallest system size n equal to 18. These are concentrated in this region. And then as you increase the system size, it starts looking a little more random. And then when you go to the larger system size, it looks more random, but it's still nowhere close to one. Okay. So what that's telling you is that for these system sizes, in some sense, this strength of the perturbation is still not enough to make this thing look non-integral. What happens in the thermodynamic limit, whether, you know, if you could in principle go to very, very large system sizes, would this be enough and how this threshold, you know, how much of, how strong does the perturbation have to be so that it looks non-integrable, how that scales with the system size, is of course a very interesting and an open question, but let's not go into that. But I just wanted to tell you that it's an important uh, avenue of research. Anyway, so this is what you get for the, uh, for small values of the perturbation, then you increase the value of the, the values of the perturbation. This, in some sense, makes it more non-integral and more random. And sure enough, you see that these are going up. And then for even larger values, these go up further. And now for the larger system size, you are getting pretty close to one. And finally, when you have an even larger perturbation, then for the largest system size in this area of the spectrum, in the middle of the spectrum, it looks like you have got up to a value which is equal to one. Okay. Well, what's interesting, so, so the first message from this is that if you increase the strength of the interaction, sorry, the, the perturbation which breaks the integrability, even for these system sizes, there is a region of the spectrum where the eigenstates do indeed look random. Okay. But you can see that, that even for this large value of the perturbation, if you go into the tails of the spectrum, meaning if you look at the very low energy eigenvalues and the very high energy eigenvalues, those don't look very random. I mean, the eigenstates corresponding to them don't look very random. Okay, And this is related to what we were discussing in the tutorial yesterday, that even for systems which generically over the entire Hilbert space would look non-integrable, could in confined regions of the Hilbert space, especially if those confined regions are near the edges of their energy band. So for instance, if you're looking at the lowest energy states, those may not look non-integrable because there might be some special, in quotes, conservation laws, which could arise only for that confined region of the Hilbert space. Okay, and we discussed, for those of you who were in the tutorial, we did discuss a little bit about this in terms of models for interacting fermions and Fermi liquid theory and uh, interacting bosons and uh, superfluidity. But that's, so, so you can see that here in the, low, in the lower part of the spectrum, um, you don't have, you don't see randomness. And similarly, you don't see any randomness in the upper part of the spectrum. Now you might wonder what's special about the upper part of the spectrum. But, so the thing about this system is that it's a system which has a finite bandwidth in terms of its energy spectrum, meaning that if you look at the energy per unit length, the energy per unit length is something which is bounded. Okay. See, this is different from, uh, for instance, other kinds of quantum mechanical systems that you might be um, familiar with. For instance, if you take, um, say, uh, you know, just three particles, and if you look at, you know, so each particle has uh, a dispersion which is p squared by 2m. And now, if I put, you know, if I have n particles and I put these particles in, let's say they're Fermi ones, and I put them in these levels, there is no upper bound to the energy that these particles can have, right? Because an individual particle in this dispersion can, in principle, have an energy which is infinite. So if I look at the energy per particle, if I look at all the energy eigenstates, that is unbounded. But here it turns out that because this model is on a lattice, right, it actually has a bounded spectrum. And when it has a bounded spectrum, special things happen near the edges of the spectrum. So there's a bottom edge and there's a top edge. In general, special things happen near the edges. This thing has two edges. So there's special things which are happening here. But in the middle of the spectrum, it looks pretty random. Okay. So again, you know, this, this also goes back to the applicability of random matrix theory where we said that um, 
look in the middle of the spectrum, look where the number of eigenstates is largest. The concentration of eigenstates is the largest, and that is here. So if you had to extract a density of states from this, you would find that the density of states is actually largest in this region where it looks random. Well, okay, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't get up to this value. This is the GOE value, okay? Well, I'm just saying that, you know, my, con so what I'm trying to test is how much do the energy eigenstates look like random vectors, okay? Random vectors with real coefficients. And so there's a way to characterize that randomness in terms of this quantity. So if for a given energy eigenstate, I wanted to find out how random it was, I could calculate this quantity for it and see how close it gets to the GOE value, okay? And so, and, and as I argued, the smaller this is, the less random it is, okay? So here, you can see that it doesn't get close to this, but, so this is, remember, SM divided by log, uh, divided by this factor. So when this is equal to one, that's what you've got up to the GOE value, okay? Well, that's what you're doing here, right? The, so, so the system sizes are different in the Hilbert space dimension. Right, so here, so here, of course, the issue is whether you actually are getting to a large enough system size where, in some sense, the system you know, size doesn't, are you close to the thermodynamic limit? And so here it turns out that you know, L equal to 24 and L equal to 21 seem to be doing an okay job. L equal to 18, on the other hand, not so much. But, but you know, this is the best you can do with these systems. Okay, uh, can we raise the screen now, please, and turn off the projector? Uh, do I have the control of the screen or does uh, is it here is it on this? Hmm? Yeah. Um. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, in the in the interest of time, let me continue. So 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 this this should sort of answer the question about you know how random things are and where in the spectrum do they actually look random? Okay. So let's go back to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, what we said was that if you looked at typical, if you looked at the matrix elements of um, some typical macroscopic observable in between eigens, you know, in the matrix element between eigenstate M and N of um, a Hamiltonian which thermalizes, which is non-integrable, then um, <clears throat> this has the form where E bar is equal to Em plus En by 2, and omega is equal to Em minus En. Now, an important thing which I might have only mentioned in passing yesterday, but which is indeed very important, is that this quantity, which is a function of E bar, and this quantity, which is a function of E bar and omega, are smooth functions of E bar and omega, all right? So what that means, at least, you know, what that means is if I look at this quantity, so, 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 all right, so if, I, if I'm looking at OMM, if I'm looking at the diagonal entry of this, okay, then um, it, this, this, of course, is important only when, I'm, when n is equal to m. When n is not equal to m, then this is equal to zero. So let me look at this for different m's. And uh, for each, so now, of course, if m and n are the same, then this is just going to be equal to em. So I'm going to have o as a function of em. So the smoothness of this quantity means that if I look at two energy eigenvalues, which are very close, right, two energy eigenstates whose energy eigenvalues are very close, um, the value of O in those two energy eigenstates will also be very close, right? In the limit of, the, of those energy, the difference between those energy eigenvalues going to zero, this goes to zero as well, right? So, so at least, you know, that's 
the notion of smoothness that I need for what I'm going to say about thermalization here, and similarly for this function. Okay, although this function is not going to be all that important for us because it's multiplied by something which is exponentially small in the number of degrees of freedom of the system. Okay, so this is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And what we want to show from this is that this implies thermalization in the sense of mate, in the sense of macroscopic thermalization, all right? So what we would like to do is, we would like to do the following. So we would like to start the system out in some initial state, right? Which I can write down in terms of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And then psi of t is going to be this. So this is just unitary evolution. I mean, this is just the, the Schrodinger equation. And um, so then we can calculate O of t which is this quantity, and what we would like to show from this is that if you look at this, with the t going to infinity limit specified in the sense that I mentioned in the previous lectures with all the accompanying caveats, that this is going to be what you would get from a microcanonical ensemble at the same energy as the expectation value of energy of the state, okay? So that's what we would like to show, and we'd like to see how that arises from the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, okay? Now, before we even start doing it, there's one thing which we have to be careful about, which is not something that you encounter for a classical system when the classical system is in one single microstate, okay? So when a classical system is in a particular microstate, it has a definite amount of energy, right? But a quantum system, on the other hand, if it is in a particular microstate, meaning it's in one of these states, some general state which is not an energy eigenstate, then it doesn't have a definite amount of energy, in the sense that it has a certain expectation value of the energy, but there are fluctuations about the expectation value, okay? And the fluctuations could be anything depending on what the state is, meaning that the, you know, depending what, on what the state is, the fluctuations could be large or could be small for the same expectation value of the energy, right? So to give you an example of that, so let's say that you have um, some, some, you know, some spectrum which extends over a large range of energy, right? And now suppose I construct an, a state which is one over root two of the largest energy and one over root two of the smallest energy, right? So then you know that the expectation value of energy of that will be right in the middle of the band. But it's going to have enormous fluctuations, right? On the other hand, if I looked at the eigens at an eigenstate which is very close to the middle of the band, that would have exactly the same expectation value of the energy with zero fluctuations, right? So, so that's an issue, and that is not an issue with a classical system because the microstate has a definite amount of energy. Now, what we want in order to do statistical mechanics is that we want to confine ourselves to those states which don't have huge fluctuations of energy, okay? And why is that? So the reason for that is that the energy is conserved. So whatever fluctuation of energy you had in this is also going to be the fluctuation of energy that you have in this. Psi, psi zero and psi, so this kind of unitary evolution can't wash out any fluctuations in energy. Whatever was there at the beginning is going to be there till the end, right? And so then, you know, when we, so, so if we want this thing to thermalize, if we want this thing to equilibrate, then the final state that it ends up in, or the long time state that it ends up in, isn't something which should have large fluctuations of energy, right? Because our notion of thermalization is something, in general, which doesn't have extensive large fluctuations of energy, right? The energy fluctuations are always sub-extensive. So, 
if if that is something which sounds unfamiliar to you, something which might seem a little more familiar is that energy fluctuations actually are <coughs> related to the square root of the specific heat. So that's something which you might have learned. And so the specific heat is typically extensive in the number of degrees of freedom. So the fluctuations go as square root of n. I mean, this is something which I'm sure has come up in the other lectures as well in, in, in different garbs. And so that is the typical situation. So what we need to do here is we need to confine ourselves to those initial states which don't have very large fluctuations of energy. Okay. In fact, we're going to confine ourselves to even an even more restricted set of initial states which have fluctuations of energy which you know are really very highly sub-extensive or um, what I'm going to say. So this is also partly in response to the question that you had asked me a few lectures ago. Okay. All right. Okay. So so that's so, so what we are assuming here is that so what that means in practical terms is if you look at these coefficients C m, right? These C m's are going to be non-zero only for m's which lie within a reasonably small energy window. Okay. We we don't want the C m's to be non-zero over a large portion of the spectrum because that's going to give us huge fluctuations in the energy which we don't want. So if I so what I'm saying is that you know if you write down the schematically the eigenstates of the um, the system like this, and if this thing has an expectation value of energy which is somewhere here, then we only want to look at states with this expectation value of energy, which are linear combinations of states in some small window about this energy. Okay, but what? But that's the only restriction that we're imposing. We are not imposing any other restriction in terms of what states within this window have can participate in this um, in this superposition. Yeah. Right. So 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 what I will what I have in my notes, but I may not be able to prove because of lack of time is that given ETH, given this, and given this choice, the fluctuations of any macroscopic quantity then will be as small as the fluctuations of the energy that you've chosen. Okay. Uh, at some point, I think I'll, I'll give my I'll scan these notes and give them to the organizers. So you can look at those parts which I have to skip because of lack of time. But what you said is something which is here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so all of this so here, if the Hamiltonian were not time independent, this wouldn't make any sense. Okay. So this this is all assuming that you have a system in which energy is concerned. Okay. Fine. All right. So let's proceed now. So, <coughs> all right. So remember that what we, in order to show this, in, in order to make sense of this, right, what we want is we want to do two things. So we want to show that limit t going to infinity, one of t, sorry, one by t, ot dt integrated between 0 and t is equal to O microcanonical. That's one thing. But the other thing which we also need to show in order to make sense of this, as we discussed in one of the previous lectures, is that we also want to show that this quantity is small. Okay? And in the previous lectures, I just left it at that, saying it was small, without saying what small means and how small small has to be. And we'll see now with ETH what that means. Okay? So these are the two things which we need to show in order for um, this to be true. Okay. So let's first try to calculate O of t. So, psi, so now we have everything that we need in order to calculate O of t. Okay? So O of t is going to be equal to summation over m, <coughs> excuse me, plus
okay so that's what this is equal to so now when you calculate this quantity right when you perform this average you can see that Is this going to be equal to the first term? Right? And that the second term will contribute zero to this average. Right? Okay. So here, sorry, I should say that this is m not equal to n. And here I'm making the assumption in saying that the second term doesn't contribute to the average that em is equal to en. If and only if n is equal to m, okay? So what that means is that there are no degeneracies here. Now, okay, you, that might seem like an odd assumption, but it's actually not such an odd assumption because in a non-integrable system which doesn't have any conservation laws, you wouldn't expect any degeneracies or certainly not you know, a macroscopic number of degeneracies. There might be some accidental degeneracies, but certainly not, <clears throat> not something which has a macroscopic number of degeneracies, like in an integrable system. So even if there were some degeneracies here, see, the reason that this term drops out is that you have a phase factor here, and when you average over the phase factor, if the phase factor is not equal to zero, if this thing is not equal to zero, it's going to give you zero when, when you take t going to infinity. So the only time this could create some trouble is if em is equal to en for m not equal to n, which implies a degeneracy. And what we're saying is that for systems which thermalize, right? Um, those, or even otherwise, I mean, there's no reason for exact degeneracies to occur. And, um, um, okay, no, let me just back up a little bit. So we are assuming that, there's, that there are no exact degeneracies in this system. Now, if you take an integrable system, there will be exact degeneracies. We don't expect this to hold for an integrable system anyway. And for a non-integrable system, there's no reason for a very large number of such exact degeneracies to occur. So this goes away, and you just have this. Okay? But, <coughs> excuse me, all right? So now, when we have this, we have to argue that this is equal to O microcanonical. Okay? So now, remember that... <coughs> Remember that we said that CMs, we are starting with a state in which the CMs are confined to only a small energy window about the expectation value of energy. So the CMs are confined to a small energy window. And because we've made the assumption that this is a smooth function of the energy, right? If the energy window is sufficiently small, then what's going to happen is that all the m's within that energy window, the OMMs, are essentially going to be the same, but with some small fluctuations, right? So, so that is the assumption of the smoothness of this. So if that is the case, then I can pull the OMM out of the, so this is going to be equal to this because of this condition, right? And what was the E here? So E here is just the expectation value of the initial state that I started with. Okay? The CMs, right? See, ket M doesn't have a value. It's an abstract object. Kets don't have any, kets are not numbers, right? You can't talk about kets being large or small, or zero. Or, so what I'm saying is that you start with some state, which is some superposition of energy eigenstates, right? That's any, any state in your Hilbert space. But now we are restricting ourselves to only those states, which are superpositions of eigenstates within a small window. 
eigenstates meaning the eigenstates have energies which are in a small window. So when I say eigenstates within a small window, each m has an energy. I'm saying that this, this superposition is such that cm is equal to is something which is non-zero only if the corresponding em happens to be within a small window. Right, yes, yes, yes. Right, so, right, so this is m equal to 1, let's say, m equal to 2, m equal to 3, and this has energy e1, e2, e3. So that's what I said here, right? Let's say this is the expectation value of the energy of that state, right? But I'm, so I'm assuming that it's only made up of energy eigenvalues which are close to this expectation value in some small window. Okay? All right. So then we have this. Um, and this, so now this is going to be mod cm squared, right? Summation over m. But that's just the normalization condition. This is equal to 1, right? So therefore, this quantity. is this going to be equal to OE plus corrections, of course, right? That's the reason, that's the reason for this funny equality sign. And those are the corrections that he was talking about, um, which, was, which are going to fall off sufficiently quickly in, you know, which are going to be sufficiently small and sub-extensive if this is an extensive quantity. And the sub-extensivity of those is again coming from this, restriction in energy space, but that's something which, I'm, which I won't be able to prove now because of lack of time. It's in my notes and you can see where that comes from. So this is equal to O at the expectation value of the energy, okay? Now what about O microcanonical? So O microcanonical is also going to be this because O microcanonical is just an equal weight superposition, right, of all the OMMs within this window. And because this window is sufficiently small so that the OMMs are essentially constant up to some small fluctuations, this is also O microcanonical, right? Again, this is all up to fluctuations, remember. So that proves the first part that this is equal to that. And you know, up to these corrections, which are going to be sub-extensive. So that's the first part. So that, but we also need the second part. And why do we need the second part? The second part is this notion that for thermalization to occur, you start in some initial state, and then you wait sufficiently long, right? And after a sufficiently long time, these observables take on them their values in the microcanonical ensemble and continue doing that, right? Meaning that it's not like if you, if you wait even longer, then you'll see that these observables will relapse to taking you know, some other values or something. And to ensure that that happens, we need to make sure that this is also small. This is a fluctuation, OK? So this can be calculated as well. So let me just um, write down the expression for this. So sigma O squared is equal to limit, okay, so I've written down uh, that expression there. So when, so when you do the calculation, um, you can work this out for yourselves. So this is limit t going to infinity, 1 over t, 0 to t, and now there's O m n, O p q, c m star, Cp star, Cn, Cq, e to the power of i, Em plus Ep minus En minus Eq, T by h bar minus O. Um, you know this this quantity. Let's say O microcanonical squared, this whole thing, dt. So when you take this expression for O of t, right, put it in there, and then open up the square, what you will find is that this is what you're going to be left with. 
And so this is just algebra. And uh, I'd urge you to do the algebra for yourselves and see that you know, this is indeed what you get. OK. Now, so you can see why it has this general form. Because I'm squaring O. So that's the reason there are two factors of these O's. And there are four factors of the C's. Right? And, and also that instead of having a difference between two energies as you do here, you have something in the phase factor which involves four energies. So now you can see that here, as opposed to the previous case, there will be situations for which this is going to be equal to zero. So we have something like EM plus EP is equal to EN plus EQ. If that happens, then you can see that this phase is zero, and this thing is not going to average to zero. Okay. So now we can ask, under what are the cases for which this happens? Okay. And so the assertion is, again, that for a sufficiently non-integrable system, the only situations where this happens, so this implies, let me see if I've got all the plus and minus signs correct. Okay, so this implies that either M is equal to Q and P is equal to N, or it's the other way around, that M is equal to N and P is equal to Q. And this is what is called the no resonance condition. Okay, so let me just spend a little bit of time on this. So you can see that these, the left hand side is going to be equal to the right hand side clearly if either of these two conditions are satisfied. Right? But there we are not talking about four different states. That is something which only involves two states because M is equal to Q and N is equal to P or the other way around. M, N, P, and Q are not four distinct states in that case. So what we are saying is that there are no four distinct states for which this happens. Right? Or in other words, if I write this equation as EM minus EN is equal to EQ minus EP, what this is saying is that there are also no large number of differences in energy, right, which occur in a system like this. It's not just degeneracies that we're talking about. We're actually talking, we, here we're talking about differences in energy. So if I look at some state here at this energy and some state at that energy and look at the difference, I get an energy difference. There is no other pair of states which, okay, well, I mean, there's no large number of other pairs of states which have exactly the same energy difference. Okay, so in, the, in such a situation, what you can show is, and this is again algebra that I urge you to do, that these cases where m is equal to q and p is equal to n or this one, so those are the cases for which this is not going to go to zero, this is not going to average to zero, but those are the ones which will exactly cancel this term here, right? And for the other cases, this is going to average to zero. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, I should, when I say it can, okay, so those are going to cancel this term, and um, so, uh, wait, 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 okay, actually, just give me a second, I'm a little bit confused. No, so those are not, okay, sorry, those are not going to exactly cancel this term. So what will happen is that this, when you do the algebra, is going to end up looking like this, with this condition, mod cm squared, mod cn squared, mod omn squared. Okay, sorry, that's what's going to happen when you impose this condition. This is what this is going to be equal to. But this is something which is bounded. Okay, so this is exactly equal to this under this condition. But this object here is bounded by the maximum value of omn squared, because this is a positive quantity, times n not equal to m mod cm squared mod cn squared. Right? So this is a sum of positive quantities. And this is clearly bounded by the case in which all the terms in the sum have the largest value that this quantity can have. Right? So this is the bound for this. And this is where the second term in this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis expression becomes important because it tells you that even this bound is something, the maximum that it can be, this bound, is something that is exponentially small in the number of degrees of freedom because it has the e to the minus s factor, s of e factor in uh, 
in, in the expression. So maximum of OMN squared is something which is going to be of order e to the minus n. It's going to be something which will, okay, I can write this. It is going to be which is something which will go as e to the minus alpha n. And as a result, this object is, is something which is going to fall off exponentially with the system size. So sigma O squared falls off exponentially with n. So that is the sense in which this quantity is small in ETH. That this quantity is something which is exponentially small in the number of degrees of freedom. So if you have a sufficiently large system size, okay, that tells you that this is essentially going to be, you know, effectively going to be zero. Now the exponential shouldn't be, the appearance of the exponential shouldn't be all that surprising, right? Because we argued right at the beginning when we were looking at classical systems and made some estimate of how likely is it for a single microstate which enters some typical equilibrium cell to actually take an excursion out of the equilibrium cell, right? Uh, no, no, see, here's the thing. That's not what this is saying. This is not placing any restriction on how small this can be, right? In fact, EM minus EN is something, if you, look at, if you look at differences in energy, you will see that the energy difference, the smallest energy difference, is, actually, is something which will actually go to zero in the limit of the number of degrees of freedom going to infinity. That also goes to zero exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. But that is not what this condition is. This condition is saying that no matter what this is, you're not placing any bound on how large or how small this thing has to be. No matter what it is, for two distinct states M and N, there isn't another pair of distinct states P and Q which has exactly the same energy difference. That is what this is saying. It's not telling you how small or large that energy difference can be. No, 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 no. This is, this is different, right? No. Okay, so let me give you an example of a system with no degeneracies where this condition is not... Uh, this condition doesn't hold. It's a system which you're all familiar with. If you take the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, right? The one-dimensional harmonic oscillator doesn't have any degeneracies. But this condition is violated for every pair of distinct states, well, not, yeah, for every pair of distinct states, because you know that the energy difference between successive states is just a constant, right? So the energy differences are only, you know, so, so let's say you say, let's say you look at an energy difference which is equal to h bar omega. So that could be because of an energy difference between the ground state and the first excited state, or the first excited state and the second excited state, or the, you know, or the, or the 99th excited state and the 100th excited state. But there are no degeneracies in a system like that, but this condition is not satisfied. So this is a different condition. Okay, uh, all right. So, okay, so this sort of very quickly proves thermalization for macroscopic observables. Um, given the ETH condition, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis condition, and this restriction on initial states being of this form. Okay? This is not, of course, all of this is not going to work if you didn't have this restriction on the form of your initial states, because then your CMs would not be confined to a small energy window. Okay? And then, of course, you wouldn't be able to make statements like this and argue that this is equal to that. But what's interesting about this is that once you have made that restriction, that the CMs have to lie within this window, there is no further restriction on how the CMs have to be distributed within this window. Okay? So in fact, you could take the most extreme point of view, which is to say that only one of the CMs is equal to one, and all the other CMs are zero, which means that the state is exactly an energy eigenstate, right? And this and these two conditions tell you, of course, the first one in that case becomes um, trivial, but the second one you still have to worry about the uh, uh, RMNs sitting there. 
But this condition tells you that even a single energy eigenstate is thermal. Right? So a single energy eigenstate for macroscopic observables gives you the same values that you would expect from a microcanonical distribution at that energy. Right? So, so this is interesting because this allows you, if you like, to do statistical mechanics with one single state ensembles. So you don't need to look at, uh, you know, you don't need to look at an ensemble of states in some energy, so, some small energy window centered about a particular energy. You just look at the energy eigenstate of that energy. Now, of course, you might wonder, how do I know that there's an energy eigenstate at that energy? Now, the reason that that will almost certainly happen for a sufficiently large system is that if you have a sufficiently large system with some banded energy per uh, degree of freedom, then as you increase the number of degrees of freedom, the spacing between the energy eigenstates is going to go to zero exponentially in the number of degrees of freedom. So within that band, if you were to just point your finger at some energy, there's going to be, for a sufficiently large system, there's going to be an energy eigenstate arbitrarily close to that energy. Okay? So you can actually do statistical mechanics for quantum systems if the ETH holds with one single energy eigenstate. Okay? There's another way of looking at this, which is also interesting, which is to say this, that if you actually do expect this condition to hold, right? regardless of which initial state you're starting with, then it should hold, okay, now, the, the difference between quantum systems and classical systems is that in classical systems, if you are looking at a microstate, unless it's a very pathological situation, a microstate is guaranteed to evolve under dynamical evolution, right? So, so, so take a gas, and again, the classical gas, a microstate Mean, so, so saying that the system is in a particular microstate means that you have specified all the position coordinates and all the momentum coordinates of all the particles. Okay? Now you can ask, are, is this microstate going to change as a function of time? Are these numbers going to change as a function of time? And the answer is almost certainly yes, unless you have some crazy situation in which these were you know, hard spheres and your initial microstate was one where all these particles were just not moving. They had zero speeds. Then it wouldn't. But that's, you know, other than that, for, for any given energy, you would clearly expect a microstate that you start with to evolve. But that is not true of a quantum system. In, <clears throat> if you consider these states in the Hilbert space to be microstates, because at every energy, again, you know, in the sense, now I'm thinking of a system with a very large number of degrees of freedom so that you have a continuous spread of energy eigenstates, at every energy, you have one state which is not going to evolve, which is the energy eigenstate at that energy. But if you demand this to happen, if you demand this to happen for arbitrary initial states which satisfy this condition, right, then it also has to happen for an energy eigenstate. Right? But the energy eigenstate is not evolving. This is not doing anything. Which means that the energy eigenstate to begin with, that state itself had to have been thermal. And that is sort of the essence of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Now, as I said, this is a hypothesis. It needs to be tested. And indeed, you know, it fails for systems where the assumptions are violated, uh, meaning that, you know, these kinds of assumptions about degeneracies and so on, integrable systems are systems for which it fails. And so what happens for an, and one of the reasons that it fails for an integrable, the way the failure shows up is that this function here, one of the ways in which the failure shows up, is that this function here is not a smooth function of the energy. Okay? Now, why that should be true is also not very difficult to see. So an integrable system is something which has, in the way we were looking at it, you know, a very large number of conservation laws. So now let's say you look at some particular energy eigenstate. So that the energy eigenstate, of course, has a definite value of the energy, but it would also have a definite value, it would also have definite values of all these other conserved quantities. Okay? Now let me look at some other energy eigenstate, which is very close in energy to the initial one. So the energies are very close. But that doesn't guarantee that the values of all these other conservation laws, this very large number of conservation laws, also have to be close between the two states. Right? Those could be wildly different. 
And as a result, you could have wild fluctuations in general in the values of macroscopic observables between those two states, even though they happen to be very close in energy. So that's what you would typically see for an integrable system. So again, because of lack of time, I don't have, you know, I can't show you the numerical data on these systems, but I did give the organizers a list of references. And then there's a review article by, um, uh, you know, the, the author list contains Marcos Rigol and Anatoly Polkovnikov, where they have it's a review article, it's an extensive review of numerical calculations which have been done to test these things. So you can look at the review article and you can look at data uh, which actually displays this. Okay? Um, so any questions? Yeah. The last part about what? Oh, why for integrable systems you would not expect this in general to be a smooth function. That, okay. So an integrable system means that there is a very large number of conserved quantities, right? So if I look at an energy eigenstate, not only does it have a definite value of energy, it also has a definite value of all these other quantities. So let me look at two states, two eigenstates, which are very close in energy. That's the only restriction that I'm placing on them. And I'm not placing any restriction on how close these other values have to be. So two energy eigenstates which are very close in energy can have values of these other conserved quantities which are massively different. Okay? And hence, and you know, and you have a very large number of such quantities, and hence you might think that you know, there's no reason for some macroscopic observable in these states to have, if you look at the expectation value, right? For instance, these conserved quantities are uh, you know, some kind of are, are observables which have massively fluctuating values. So you might think that, you know, in general, there's no reason for some macroscopic observable to have very close values in these two energy eigenstates, even though their energies are very close. No, that's, that's a function of the energy, but, but, you know, it doesn't have to be a smooth function of the energy. O as a function of E could do something like this, right? That's also a function of the energy. The point here is that in, in ETH, you're, you're saying that this, this is a smooth function of the energy, which means that when energy differences go to zero, these differences also go to zero. Or when energy differences are small, these differences are small. And that doesn't have to be true for an integrable system. Yeah. No, not energy gap. A small distribution of, when you write it as a superposition, it, it is a superposition of, of eigenstates which are very close in energy, within some window, yes. Okay, first ETH ingredient that we used was, in, to prove this, we used the fact that, so when you're trying to prove this, okay, here, you don't have to worry about OMNs, because of the fact that, uh, you know, this in any case is, is taken care of, this is getting rid of the OM and the off-diagonal elements, but you do need the fact that this is a smooth function of E. That is what allowed me to pull this thing out of the summation. If this were not a smooth function, if this were something like that, right, then even though, even if the CMs were non-zero only in some small window of energy, I wouldn't be able to pull the OMM out of the sum. Okay, that's one ingredient. The other ingredient of ETH is when you do this here, and you argue that this is less than or equal to that, then to say that this is something that's exponentially small requires the second term, the off-diagonal term, to be like this. So the ETH has very much gone into this. Okay. So that's, so that's a good point. Look, here it, it seems very general. I've just said that this is some macroscopic observable. Now, it could be, and so there's a long discussion on um, this in this review article, that despite the fact that your system is integrable, there are some, you know, some fairly large set of macroscopic observables which would look thermal, right? See, the argument that I gave you was a very loose one. I mean, I just sort of wanted to tell you why it is plausible that when you have an integrable system, there could be wild fluctuations in 
the values of observables. But by no means was that to suggest that if you give me any macroscopic observ observable that has to fluctuate wildly from eigenstate to eigenstate if the system is integral, right? And that's not true. So in fact, people have looked at integrable systems and looked at different kinds of macroscopic observables and characterized the fluctuations of these observables from eigenstate to eigenstate within a window and found that, you know, those fluctuations are, could be very different for different observables. But what you know for an integrable system is that it's not going to be a smooth function for all macroscopic observables. So that's, that's the, uh, so, so since you brought that up, it turns out that integrable systems can also be described by, I mean, you have a version of ETH even for integrable systems, except that on the right hand side, you don't have O as obtained from a microcanonical ensemble. You have O as opposed to <clears throat> as obtained from something called a generalized Gibbs ensemble, which is an ensemble which has, you know, which basically has something like uh, a, a distribution which is not just a function of energy, but is a, is a function of all these, you know, all these conserved quantities. So, so it's like saying that when you look at, say, the canonical distribution, and if you say energy is conserved between a system and, um, okay, okay, let me not, okay, let me not go into that, but because, you know, I, again, I'm running out of time, but there's something called a generalized Gibbs ensemble, which allows you to define a form of ETH even for integrable systems. But as you said, that, you know, which operator will look thermal and which operator will not look thermal is, is something which you need to figure out by doing calculations. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, okay, so I think the, the analog of this for a classical integrable system would be something like this. So, so in a classical integrable system, the analog of this viewpoint is this individualist viewpoint where you're saying that there is an equilibrium cell where in which, which, which is a set of microstates for which these macroscopic observables have their equilibrium values, okay? So now the thing is that if the system is integrable, um, I don't know if you would still, you could, and you look at a small, You've got some family of macro observables, even for an integrable system. Confine yourself to a certain family. And then is there still a sufficiently large equilibrium cell such that, you know, so is there still an equilibrium cell with an overwhelmingly large volume such that the values of these macro observables look like the thermal values? I, I, I don't know. It's... Right, for integrable, I'm not, yeah, for integrable systems, yes. Right. Right. So I think, I think one of the, I, I don't know how much these things have been tested for classical systems. I, one of the reasons that these things have really become of, you know, have, have, have really attracted a lot of attention for quantum systems is because you can now do experiments on isolated quantum systems and actually in some sense test the consequences of these things. Right. But isolation? No, okay, no. I, I was not talking about computer experiments. I was actually talking about... Right. Right. Right, right. Okay, so, so, so I must confess that I'm not very familiar with that literature. People might have worried about this for classical integrable systems. Right. Which would seem thermal despite the fact... Right. So, so that could very well happen. I mean, that, that also happens with these uh, quantum integrable systems, for sure. Okay, um, fine. So in the remaining 25 minutes or so, so all right, so this, I mean, I, I really wanted to spend more time on ETH and MATE than I've ended up doing. Uh, but, you know, please do look at my notes because, because they have many more calculations about, you know, these things like fluctuations over these, uh, these values that I've written down, you know, how to calculate that and so on. So what this demonstrates, so here, here, you know, what this is, what you've done here is you have looked at the expectation values of characteristic macroscopic observables. So this is in some sense really looking at MATE, macroscopic thermalization coming from ETH. So there's also the question of MITE, right, which is microscopic thermalization, which has to do with subsystems. Now you could, in principle, push this and say that the operators that you're looking at here are, you know, right now it's, 
I mean, I haven't anywhere really used the fact that I'm looking at a macroscopic operator. I've just said that, you know, it is some macroscopic operator. You could, in principle, make this ansatz for something for an operator which is microscopic, meaning that an operator which is uh, basically, you know, something which involves only a small number of degrees of freedom in some confined region of the system and check whether this thing holds, okay? And people have done that as well. And, but that's, and that, you know, that works. Uh, but it turns out that it works for a stronger reason because you can prove microscopic thermalization in a slightly different way, which I'll do right now. And microscopic thermalization implies macroscopic thermalization. Okay, so um, so that's what I intend to do for in the in the remaining time that I have in this lecture. And as we discussed in the first couple of lectures, this has to do with the equilibration of subsystems. Okay, so we need to explicitly look at subsystems, consider subsystems in some way. So the idea is that we're not going to think of this large isolated system as being in a single pure quantum state, and ask under what conditions can that imply thermalization of a subsystem in the sense that I mentioned earlier. So, so just to refresh your memory, what I want to do is this. So this, this is my full quantum system, okay? I'm going to partition this, and as I said, the partition can in principle be done in abstract terms, in terms of distributing the degrees of freedom into two sets, but I'm really sort of thinking of partitioning this somehow in real space, although that's not particularly important to what I have to say next, but you know, it's, it's just useful to think of it that way, and that's also perhaps uh, the setting in which you can test these things experimentally. So you have a system and a bath, right? And the full system is in some pure state psi, so therefore, the density matrix of the full system is this, from which I can obtain the reduced density matrix for the system by tracing out the bath degrees of freedom. Okay, And so, might says that if I start from some initial state, right, and let the system evolve, then, um, okay, so then I have the full system is always in a pure state, but the density matrix is now time dependent because the state is, um, <clears throat> okay, sorry, actually let me, uh, no, if it's in a pure state, of course, yeah, I don't even need the time dependence here, so it's just this. Okay, so this is the density matrix, sorry. So this is the density matrix. And then if I look at this object in the limit that the bath goes to infinity, then this has to look like this divided by trace of e to the power of minus beta hs, provided I can pass the Hamiltonian of the full system into something for the bath and something for the system. So I'm assuming that the coupling between the bath and the system is negligible. So I'll be, I'll be operating under that assumption, okay? But this is sort of microscopic thermal equilibrium when you are starting from a pure state for the whole system. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to prove this and see for what class of initial states is this true. So it turns out that the class of initial states for this is for which this is true for a generic non-integrable system, and again by non-integrable system here. I'm going to assume that its energy eigenvalues are random in some basis, in some given basis, is actually remarkably large. So, so the class of initial states for, for which this happens is actually a very remarkably large class of states for, um, <coughs> excuse me, for these uh, non-integrable systems. So this goes by the name of canonical typicality. That if you consider a typical state of this system, not an energy eigenstate necessarily, a typical state of, with, with certain restrictions, 
Just like here, we had the restriction that these CMs had to be, you know, non-zero only within a small energy window. So something similar, we need something similar here as well. But up to those restrictions, right? There, there is, you know, aside from those restrictions, um, there isn't any further restriction on a typical state giving you this kind of canonical distribution. So hence the name canonical typicality, that states are canonically typical. Okay, and this is uh, a pretty sort of important and powerful notion. And again, you know, this is due to a large number of people in different forms. In its most recent incarnation, it's due to Leibovitz, Popescu, and collaborators. But some of these ideas actually go back to Schrodinger and von Neumann. So you know, this is this is an idea that's been around for a while, but it's been formalized only recently. Okay. So let's just. Um, so how do we prove this? So the first thing which we do to prove this is to realize that in the limit that the bath goes to infinity, e to the power of minus beta hs trace of e to the power of minus beta hs is something which you would get by tracing the bath out of a microcanonical distribution, right? Oh, sorry, it's, it's limits on both sides. I'm saying, right, I'm, say, I'm saying that you need the, see, you can always take this, look at, look at this expression, and trace out the bath, regardless of how large the bath is, and get something for your subsystem, but that's not going to look like this unless you've taken the bath to infinity. Oh, right, actually, yeah, okay. Yeah. I guess this is, yeah, right, yes, yes, I, I was just, Right, 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 yes, right, yes, yes. I mean, okay, so, so, so actually maybe what I should really do is I should say that this is equal to that, that without you know, removing this intermediate thing. But the reason I wrote this is for, uh, but there's a reason that I wrote this. And the reason that I wrote this is you can show, and this is again an exercise um, for you, that the quantity on the right-hand side limit B going to infinity, trace B rho microcanonical is equal to the following quantity. Okay, so let me just write this down. And then I'll explain what these terms are. Okay. So how do we define rho microcanonical? So this is something which we went over in the second or the third lecture, I forget. That you basically take your full system and look at a small window of energies between E and E plus delta. And within that window of energies, you weight all eigenstates equally. By, you know, that weight is the inverse of the volume of that window. Or, um, sorry, no, the, the weight is equal to the inverse of the Hilbert space dimension of that window. And that's what this quantity is. So H here is the Hilbert space dimension of this energy window 
between E and E plus delta. Okay, that's what this is. This, okay, this here is the Hilbert space dimension of the bath. So we have E S plus E B, which is equal to E, the total energy has to lie between E and E plus delta. Okay. So now if I say that my system is in a particular microstate with energy E S I, right? that places restrictions on what the energy of the bath can be because es plus eb has to be has to be in this window okay so this here is the dimension of the hilbert space of the bath the dimension of the hilbert space that's available to the bath to satisfy this energy condition when my system is in this particular microstate when my system is in this particular energy eigenstate Okay, so is that clear to everyone? If not, let me just go over the argument again. We've said that we can pass the energy of the full system in this form. E sorry, of the full system in this form, E S plus E B is the total energy, which has to lie within this window. Okay. Now what I'm doing is I'm saying that the system here, S, this thing, has a certain fixed energy, E I. It's in some energy eigenstate with energy E I. What does that imply for the bath, if that is true? What that implies for the bath is that the bath has to now be in a window of energies, which is between E minus E I S and E minus E I S plus delta. Okay? So that gives you a Hilbert space of available states for the bath. Right? This is the dimension of that Hilbert space. And you can and in case, you know, and, and in case this is again, this seems mysterious to you, in the classical case, this would just be the available phase space volume of the bath. This would be like the available phase space volume of the total system. So this is the ratio of the available phase space volumes of the bath and the system, which is the thing which gives you the e to the power of minus beta e factor in your, in the derivation of the canonical ensemble. Here, because we are doing quantum mechanics, the volumes have been replaced by dimensions of these Hilbert spaces. Okay? Any questions? No. Right. So then it, so, so this expression is particularly convenient because if we can show that for some state, when you calculate rho s, right, trace, trace over b rho, when you calculate that, that is equal to this in the limit that the bath is going to infinity, we are done. Right? So this is what we need to show. So what we need to show is that for a typical state, okay, this is equal to rho s for a typical state, rho s defined that way. Okay? All right. So now in order to show this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that typical states here are going to be random states within some energy window. Okay? Uh, actually, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, within some energy window. So let me write that down. So any state psi, I can write as this. So you give me some vector in this Hilbert space, not necessarily normalized to one, and I can of course normalize it by its norm. And you'll see in a second why this is important and why this is convenient, and that is a state, okay? So we're going to look at states. So every state has this form, okay? And what I can do now is I can write phi in the following form. So any state phi here can be written as a linear combination of products of eigenstates of the system and the bath, right, with these CIGs. Okay, so here what that means is that H system EIS is equal to EIS, EIS, and H bath, EJ bath is equal to EJ bath, ket EJ bath. Right? And right? 
Okay. Right. So now let's look at states like this. And let's look at, by typical, let me look at states in which the CIJs are random. Okay. So I can choose states. By typical, I mean random now. And you see why eigenstates are also going to be typical because, you know, as I said, the main thing about non-integrable systems is that the eigenstates are going to look random in some generic basis. And you can say that passing the system into some generic system and bath is providing a generic basis for the whole system. And these are going to look random. But we're not focusing only on the energy eigenstates here of the whole system. We're looking at anything where any state which can be written like this, where these can be considered random. And what do I mean by saying that these are random? What I mean by saying <clears throat> that these are random is that the average of these is equal to zero. And this variance is equal to one. Okay. So this is the advantage of dividing by the norm that I can take the variance of these things to be equal to one. Okay. And that will be useful in simplifying certain uh, things. Okay. So that's what we have. So given this condition now, I can write down, I can do the following things. So from here, I can write phi as <coughs> summation over i, e, i, s times phi i, where phi i is equal to summation over j, c i j, e j b. So what I've done is I've transferred these coefficients in this um, formula to a state for the bath degree of freedom. Okay. I mean, this is just I can always write this in this form. Okay. But I can now sort of identify phi as being a sum of products of the system, an eigenstate of the system and some state of the bath, and these coefficients have now been moved into the representation of that bath state. Okay? All right. So now you can convince yourselves that when you... Sorry? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, you have a summation over i and j here. So, you, so this is summation i, summation j, and this is, and I just push this into the summation j and I've defined this. Okay? All right. So for this now, which is this quantity, again, when you <clears throat> trace out the bath degrees of freedom, right, these guys, you can show that this is going to be equal to So I think I have another five minutes. I should be able to complete the proof, but not much else in those five minutes. So you have this, okay? Right? Now this is nice because this thing down here is actually going to be equal to the dimension of the full Hilbert space, what we have down here, okay? So you can, um, I'd urge you to, given, given that these, you know, given that the CIs have, uh, where did I write that? The CIs had this distribution, yeah, this, given this and this, you can show that this is equal to the dimension of this, of the full Hilbert space. So that's already there in the denominator. It remains for us to show that this has the dimensions of HI bath. All right, so this is equal to the dimension of the Hilbert space of the bath. So now it turns out that there are, there's one limit in which that's reasonably easy to see. So we have a delta here. Remember that we're drawing the energy from some window which is between E and E plus delta. Now look at your bath. Okay, so bath has its own energy eigenstates. So if it turns out that the spacing between the energy eigenstates of the bath, the smallest spacing between the energy eigenstates of the bath is greater than delta, 
Okay, so let's say this is some EIS, EI plus 1S, and if EI plus 1S minus EIS is greater than delta, then something simple happens, okay? So then that tells you that the, sorry, EI, then the bath states, which, for, for, remember, for every EIS, there is a certain spread of the bath states because the bath energy has to lie in this window, right? So if this condition is true, what you can show very simply is that the bath states for EIS and the bath states for EI plus 1S have no overlap between them. Okay? So the set of, so the Hilbert space of bath states when the system has energy EIS, when this condition is satisfied, is distinct from the set of bath states when the energy has, when the system has this energy, provided this condition is satisfied. Okay? And then when that happens, you can easily see that <coughs> the only time that this is going to be non-zero now is if i and i prime are the same, right? If, because if i and i prime are different, then phi i and phi i prime have to be orthogonal. So under this condition, this is non-zero only when, so when this happens, phi i, phi i prime is going to be equal to norm of phi i, delta i i prime and norm of phi i is simply going to be equal to the dimension of the Hilbert space of the bath, the thing which we wanted there in the numerator. Okay. So this, when you substitute it in here, will now tell you that rho s is going to be equal to what we want. But that is for this particular situation in which these, the spacing of these levels is sufficiently large that it's greater than delta. Okay? Now, it turns out that that will, in general, certainly not be true when you take the system size of the bath to infinity because the level spacing is falling off exponentially in the size of the system. Okay? Maybe I should just move to that side of the board now, and two or three lines, and the proof is complete. Okay? So when, if EI plus 1S minus EIS is not greater than delta, okay, if it's actually smaller than delta, it turns out even then, this condition holds, and the reason this condition holds even then is that, and this is where the size of the bath going to infinity becomes particularly important. So even when this is true, phi i and phi i prime are, is going to be equal to zero when i is not equal to i prime as the size of the bath goes to infinity. Does everyone see why this has to be true? So the reason this has to be true is that these are two vectors, right, which exist in the Hilbert space of the bath. So the bath, let's say, is some n-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay? And now if you let the dimension of n go to infinity, of any vector space, you know, of any Hilbert space or so coordinate space go to infinity, and you take two vectors at random, right? As n goes to infinity, the probability that the, that the inner product of those two vectors is equal to zero. In other words, those two vectors are going to be orthogonal um, as n goes to zero, sorry, as n goes to infinity, that probability goes to one, which means that when you pluck any two random vectors in for a large Hilbert space, those are almost certainly going to be orthogonal to each other. Right? The only ones which are not going to be orthogonal to each other are those which are parallel to each other. So the thing is that, so what this is saying is that in the limit of a Hilbert space dimension going to infinity, you only have vectors which are either parallel or orthogonal. There's no notion of any intermediate angle. Okay, actually, I'll tell you what, let me just complete the proof because I'm running out of time. I just have three more lines and then I'll answer your question. Okay. So 
but if everyone else sees this, I'll just proceed. So, okay. So if this is true, then we are once again back to that condition, right? Because this again tells us that And we know that the norm of phi i is equal to the dimension of the Hilbert space of the bath. So once again, this condition holds. And so that tells you that rho s, which is equal to trace over b psi psi in the limit b goes to infinity, is for states which are typical by which I mean which are random like this, is going to be equal to e to the power of minus beta h trace of e to the power of minus beta h. Okay? So, okay, that completes the proof. Now, you can, you know, I'm, I'm sure that most of you haven't digested it fully in because of the limited amount of time in which I did it, but I'll tell you what, it, what its consequences are and then I'll stop. So, the reason that this is happening is because of the fact that typical states can be written as superpositions like this, right? Now, for instance, an atypical state would be one where, let's say, if the Cijs were equal to one for one particular combination of i and j, and zero for everything else. Or the Cijs were non-zero only for some small pairs of i and j, and zero for everything else. Those would be atypical. Now, what is, what, what is the thing which characterizes such atypical states? The thing which characterizes such atypical states is that those states have very little entanglement between the, the system and the bath. So what is crucial here is that you're saying that for a system to, for a state to have this property, it should entangle the bath and the system very strongly. If it doesn't do that, if it's a product state, for instance, which is the worst kind of state, it has zero entanglement, this wouldn't work. And the reason this wouldn't work is then you wouldn't be able to claim that these Cij's are in any way random. Okay? So now, for energy eigenstates of, of these non-integrable Hamiltonians, the you know, Berry's conjecture tells you that these Cij's will be random because this provides some generic basis in which you're expressing the energy eigenstates. And so you would expect the energy eigenstates to be in might. Okay? So this is, if you like, the proof of the energy eigenstates of, an, of a non-integrable system obeying microscopic thermalization. And in the special situations where the energy eigenstates don't have that random structure, when they're very close to being product states or very lightly entangled, this doesn't hold, this fails miserably. And in an example, and, and systems, generic, the only generic systems we know of which have that property are many body localized systems, which again, unfortunately, I don't have the time to talk about. I also don't have the time to show you that might implies mate and that there is a maximum length scale up to which might holds for a finite size system. So those are things which are in my notes, which I'll post. But anyway, so this sort of the last thing, that quantum systems have this property that pure typical states are actually thermal in the sense, in the strongest sense, that if you look at a subsystem, that obeys the canonical distribution, okay? And there is no classical analog of this. So this, in some sense, makes quantum systems quite different from classical systems from the point of view of thermalization and even makes them sort of, you know, thermalize more strongly than classical systems in some sense. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, that's the questions. Yeah. In the limit that the dimension of the Hilbert space is going to infinity. Otherwise, it's not. Clearly, that's not the case for, uh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, okay. So, so clearly, if I take a, right, if I take a one dimensional Hilbert space, then of course everything is parallel. Okay, no vector is perpendicular to any vector. If I take a two-dimensional Hilbert space, this is clearly not true, right? I can take one vector which is like this, one vector which is like that, and you have large pairs of vectors with some arbitrary angle between them. But the point is that as you keep increasing the number of dimensions, 
then in the limit that the number of dimensions goes to infinity, this is true. And you can try to convince you. So, so you don't even need to think of a Hilbert space. Just think of Cartesian space in which you are increasing the number of dimensions. Okay, so do the calculation. So my definition of what orthogonal is, is that, so okay, so what's going to happen is the following. You can uh, calculate, you can ascribe to this an angle. So forget about Hilbert space, okay? Just look at regular Cartesian space. And you look at two vectors, and you can say that, you know, there's some cosine theta, which is equal to r1 dot r2, right? Okay. And now what you can do is you can calculate the distribution of this cosine theta as a random variable if you at random pick r1 and at random pick r2. Okay. Fine. And so you'll get some distribution. And you'll get some distribution as a function of the dimension. As you increase the dimension of your, okay, and then and keep increasing the dimension of your space, okay? So you will see that that distribution is going to be peaked where cosine theta <coughs> is going to be equal to zero, right? right? Because, you know, these are some random numbers and you're summing them. Right? They could be positive or negative, you're summing a bunch of them. So the distribution is going to be peaked where cosine theta is equal to zero, which is what you're going to call as the two vectors being orthogonal. But how peaked is it? Okay, so you'll see that you know, you're going to get some kind of a, by the central limit theorem, some kind of a Gaussian distribution, which in the limit of an infinite number of dimensions is going to peak at cosine theta equal to zero. Right? It's going to be like a sharp peak at cosine theta equal to zero, with nothing anywhere else. And that's, and that's what's going into this here. Okay, so it's uh, Subrata's last lecture today, I guess. Mm, sorry? So it's your last lecture. Yes. Today, right? yeah. So let's uh, uh, thank Subrata like, uh, for his lecture.